have some encouraging news for you today. Check this out. In Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, this is what Paul says. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, and the heritage of the saints. What is the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe? God has good things for you. Oh my goodness. And wants to open your eyes to see those good things. Maybe you've been kind of thinking kind of negative thoughts lately. Maybe you've been wrestling with, ugh, you know, grim, dark, negative, despondent, discouraging, depressing thoughts. And we want to pray for you that God would open the eyes of your understanding to see the good things that he's doing in your life and to see his hope, his power, his presence in your life. So please get on the phone, call right now. That's very important that we can pray for you to see these things. God would open your eyes and you could see them. And you can also get on our website. There's a really great resource. What I love about our website is that's 24-7. Easy to get on and it's convenient. So just leave your prayer request there. And we love to get to pray for you. And partners, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being with us, for being so faithful, for being so supportive. We appreciate you. And in just a moment here, we're going to be joining a teaching that my mom has done on deliverance from bitterness. Say, what do you mean by bitterness? I've been around people who are bitter people. They always have some kind of little dig, a little jab, a little yuck, and they just seem kind of sour. They seem sour on life, sour, and it's not just a negative attitude, but there's a bitterness in them. And when you're around them, it's kind of, ugh, you're a little bit set on edge. And I believe that all of us have various things in our life that have caused us to be bitter, but I know God wants to set us free from that bitterness. So I want you to watch this teaching carefully. Put your remote control down. Mom's going to teach you on how to be free from bitterness. And I'm going to ask them if they will pass out the notes tonight because bitterness is a really ugly thing. And it, you think it's hidden and down tight inside you, but you find out that bitterness grows. Everybody say, bitterness grows. Bitterness. And so if you don't get rid of bitterness... It will grow and become a whole tree, and that's very dangerous. So uh, when we look at a tree of bitterness, we think, oh, it starts with a little tiny thing right at the beginning that, oh, well, you know, it's not that bad. But when you nurse it and replay it, and everybody here has had problems with bitterness, and probably you're having some with it tonight, you know, it just seems like uh, you get so much opportunity. And sometimes it can just be some little thing. It can be many times a vain imagination. And sometimes it can be something that we really feel we have earned a right to be bitter. But if you can see the blessings of getting on the other side of bitterness, you won't want to keep a little tiny bit of it. You won't want to nurse something that maybe your family has nursed for years because it keeps you from the blessing of God. So if you're watching on television, uh, I want you to say this with me and everyone here say, Beyond Bitterness, Beyond bitterness. Is, a is a Blessing. And so it's very important we get the blessing. Everybody wants the blessing. Uh, I remember, and I couldn't tell this for many years, I had an uncle who sexually abused me. It was a real ugly thing. And uh, I had bitterness about that and about that situation. But, you know, I forgave him. I've been so blessed in my life, I feel like I'm God's pet. You know what I'm saying? And my uncle's in heaven. He's dead. He's gone. My aunt, who's probably one of the, was like another mother to me, was such a blessing to me. But if I had lived in that bitterness and not gone to see them, cut them off, what I could have missed that God had for me. So I want you to look at your notes because I want you to see right here, right at the beginning, and those of you watching, I want you to be very sensitive to this tonight. Bitterness is extremely ugly. It has a root and can bring a tree of troubles. So it doesn't, it's not just a little thing that works today. It can bring a whole tree of things that you don't want to have. So scripture tells us here, and I start right out with Hebrews 12, and I'm going to be telling you about five people tonight in the Bible who had bitterness and got the blessing. And I'm telling you, tonight could totally change your life. What you hear tonight, 
what you hear on television, you could share with somebody and totally change their lives. Because how much bitterness has ruined people? Now let's look at someone that bitterness really ruined. Looking carefully, uh, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, that any root of bitterness springing up caused trouble, and by this many, everybody say many, become defiled. So what happens is when you get bitter, you don't take God's grace into the situation. Can God give you the grace to forgive that person? Yes, he can. But we'd rather be bitter than take the grace. And so when we get bitter, we defile ourselves. But when we get bitter and hold on to bitterness, it not only defiles us, it defiles our children, our grandchildren. It really begins a generation curse. Now, grace works two ways. I love to experience God's grace. Oh, that's so wonderful. Because it's really God's supernatural ability to act on your behalf when you don't in any way deserve it. Do you like God's grace? I love God's grace because that's really miracle working power that comes into your life from God's love for you. But then it's not only you receiving God's grace, but it's also you giving God's grace. Could you forgive someone that has really hurt you and damaged you and say, I'm just going to experience the grace of God to give away, not just to receive that he forgives me, but I'm going to experience grace to give. And so grace is something we receive, but also grace is something we give. And so we fall short of grace. We don't get that miracle working power we need to have to come to us or through us when we hold on to bitterness. So I'm going to give you five examples in the Bible. And uh, I want you to listen very closely because each one of these came out with a blessing because they got free of the bitterness. So always, always on the other side of bitterness is a blessing. And how many people miss the blessing because they hold on to the bitterness? So if you look at Job, Job said over and over seven times in his life, oh, I have bitterness of soul. He was so bitter. Well, you look at his circumstances, I think the poor guy, I probably would have been real bitter too because he loses 10 children, and it all happened just quickly, quickly, quickly. He loses not only 10 children, he loses all of his finances. He was a very wealthy man. He was a very well-known man in the East, considered the wealthiest man in the East. And then he loses his health, and he has a wife who tells him, why don't you curse God and die? I notice that the wife didn't die. Satan kept her alive to bug him. No, no, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> And then he had three friends who were very cruel to him who came. So, you know, here is a man with much opportunity for bitterness, not only from those three major circumstances, but his wife and the friends. And so we're going to see, though, that he got on the other side and got the blessing. So let's look at it. He lost everything. So he felt so bitter. Let's look at Esau. Because bitterness comes from losing something. And Esau lost his blessing. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me, me also, my father. Now we know bitterness is of the soul. So when we get bitter, it really touches our emotions and then our mind begins to play with it and replay it. So it's a soul area. So he was so bitter. And he cried out because he lost the blessing. Now, if you look at Esau, what happened? And we would say, well, yeah, I understand why he'd be bitter. Because the blessing was to come to him. He was the elder son. So he deserved the blessing. Except God had a different plan, really. And so uh, his mother hears his father, Isaac, speaking one day that he wants to bless Esau. So he said, you know, go make me some stew, get some wild meat, make me some stew because I want to give you the blessing. But, you know, she didn't feel that Esau should have the blessing. She felt that Jacob, that they were twins, should have the blessing. 
So she got to Jacob and said, you know, the blessing shouldn't be his. It wasn't really even prophesied that way. So I want you to go in and pretend you're Esau. Your father doesn't see well. And Esau's very hairy. We'll put some fur on you. And your father will bless you. And you'll get the blessing. And so that was bad news. Is that true? Bitterness often comes out of really bad news. It's not always vain imagination. So here is Jacob. He goes in, pretends he's Esau, and even his father was suspicious. Well, your voice sounds like Jacob. You feel like Esau. And the mother had fixed the stew. And so he blesses Jacob with such blessings. When you start reading through Old Testament this year, you'll love this in Genesis. I always like going through all of this in Genesis. I don't know. All those things touch me. And so he blesses Jacob, and then Esau comes in with the stew, is all ready for the blessing, and Jacob has walked off with it. And he's bitter. And you see, folks, we feel like, and this is where we get into a very dangerous arena, that we have a right to be bitter. You may have a right to be bitter, but if you hold on to the right to be bitter, you will not get the blessing that's on the other side of the bitterness. So it's very important we understand, oh, I have a right to be bitter. Okay, you have the right to be bitter, but now you have the right to lose your blessing. So watch it very carefully. You need to go to Johannesburg, South Africa with Sarah and me for the most blessed time of your life to minister. It will be so awesome, and you can get your brochure today. Is that right? That's right. Call or get on the website for the information. And we have an additional opportunity, yes. Mom, uh, for an excursion to Cape Town to see a safari as well as Robbins Island where Nelson Mandela was. Um, absolutely amazing things that are in Cape Town. That's an additional excursion. But the primary thing we want to encourage you with here is our ministry opportunities in Johannesburg. We're going to be ministering at nighttime as well as a Saving Moses opportunity. This is a life-changing trip and you don't want to miss out. Mom, how can they come? They can come and get the brochure, but you could also scholarship someone to go. And a group of you could get together and scholarship your pastor and totally bless him and change his life. We want to hear from you today. Now let's look at another one because maybe none of your bitterness has to do with situations this bad. I doubt that anybody here has lost their health, 10 children, all their wealth, has an ugly wife and three mean friends. <laughs> right? Okay. Now let's look at Naomi. Naomi is another one. She got so bitter, she said, just call me bitter. And she goes back to Bethlehem and her friends come out to see her. Don't call me Naomi. That means pleasant. Call me Mary, Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. So she blames it on God. And most people do. They're mad at God. God did it. Where is God in it? So she says, you know, I lost my husband. And she did. They moved to Moab, which was a bad move. They took their two sons down there. The two sons married Moabitess girls. It was all bad move, bad move. And the husband dies, and the sons die. And Naomi is a widow with nothing, no hope. And she makes a decision to go back to Bethlehem. And so when she gets there, she's full of bitterness. Don't call me pleasant anymore. Just call me Mara. I'm so bitter. I've been treated so bitterly by God. And so you may be sitting here thinking that. 
Man, God has been bitter, hard with me. But remember, you may have, think you have a right to be bitter, but on the other side of the bitterness is a blessing. And holding on to that right to be bitter, you may never get the blessing that God has on the other side of it. So watch this closely. Hannah is another one. The Bible tells us she was in bitterness of soul. Where does bitterness come? Tell me. Where does bitterness come? When bitterness comes to you, does it attack your feet? What does it attack? Your mind and your emotions. And maybe you're watching on television and you say, oh, I'm just such a bitter mess. Call us for prayer. We'd love to pray for you or get on our website. We'd love to pray because God can set you free. And always remember, there's a blessing on the other side of bitterness. So here is Hannah. She's in bitterness of soul. She prays to the Lord and she weeps in anguish. Now I would look at Hannah and I would probably say, well, this poor woman, yeah, I can imagine she'd be bitter because she didn't have any children. And the other wife, Penina, she had all the children. And the husband loved her, was good to her, but the other wife had the babies. So the other wife really squished her, just only barraged her. Well, yeah, he may love you, but I got the kids, you know, and I've got the babies, and you poor thing, you don't have any babies. And it just, oh, it made Hannah very bitter. And so she prayed out to God in the bitterness of her soul. So you say, wow, you know, I can see. Couldn't have children. Somebody's uh, hammering on you all the time. You could really get bitter in this. I want to stop here and tell an experience that Dr. Cho told one time about a woman in his church. Now, you know, of course, if you pastored a church of a million people, you'd have a lot of stories to tell. But this was in the early beginning of his church. And a couple came to him, and the woman uh, was dressed like she was pregnant. And they said to him, you know, Dr. Cho, uh, we really want to have a baby. Well, he said, looks like God's answered your prayer. They said, no, no. Uh, she said, I'm not really pregnant. She said, I have a pillow and I'm dressed like I'm pregnant. Because she said, we live with my husband's parents, and the, this was the custom. And she said, uh, and I have to have a baby because if I don't, they will put me out and she said, and he will marry someone else. And I don't have an education. I can't make a living. I'll just become a woman of the streets. Would you pray with us? He said, well, how do you want me to pray? She said, well, there's a girl in the country who's pregnant out of wedlock. And she said, I am pretending to my husband's family that I'm pregnant. I'm telling a lie. We're pretending it together. And she said, when the baby is born, she said, I'm going to go someplace else and act like I'm having the baby there, but then I'll just pick up this baby and bring it. Then I can stay in the home and we can remain as a married couple. And she said, I know this is a sin. We're lying. We're being deceptive. What shall we do? <laughs> I'll never forget what Dr. Cho said. He said, well, go ahead and do it. And when you go to heaven and God asks you about that lie, say, give that sin to Dr. Cho. And you say, that's not very scriptural. But I can't help but laugh about it because that woman could have been in extreme bitterness. And I guess she did have the baby and she stayed with the family. And I'm not telling you, go tell a lie. So don't say, oh, Meryl, she's just lying now. No, I'm not. The next one I want to talk to you about is Peter. Peter, oh man. He remembered the word of Jesus who said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is a different thing. He was bitter at himself. Do you ever think, I've done so many stupid things. I've acted and said such wrong things, you know, and everything. I'm just bitter at myself. What's the use? I'm just a mess. And he wept bitterly about what he had done. So we see five cases here of bitterness and really different circumstances, different situations. But I want to go back through them and I want to show you how each of them got a miracle. I want to go back through them. Now let's look at Job. Job, he had much, much opportunity to be bitter, 
But a friend came to him in the middle of the book of Job, or really more toward the end, named Elihu. And he said to the friends, you know, you're telling him all these things that if he had acted right, he wouldn't have had these problems. So the problem is he's been sinning. And Job's been defending himself that he really is a very righteous person. He helps the poor, does everything right. But he said, really, Job, what you need is a revelation from God. And you need to look to God and say, God, you tell me, what's the problem here? You give me an answer. And Job was smart enough to do that. And God spoke to him, and I'm always amazed at how God handles problems. God handles people with questions and answers. You know, he said to Jonah, when Jonah blew it so badly and said, kill all the Ninevites, God says to Jonah, well, do you well to be angry? I'd have slapped him sideways. But he said, It's not a good thing for you to be angry, Jonah. And he really, I believe, led Jonah back into a good place. And so he questions and answers. When Jesus went to Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Man, Peter had really blown it. So the question and answer thing, he really put to Job. I counted how many questions he asked Job, 185. And then Job said, I abhor myself. I'm not a righteous person. I repent in ashes. So he got a revelation and he repented. Everybody say revelation Revelation. and repented. repented. Now let's look at the blessing. Woo, let's look at the blessing. Did Job get blessed? He lived double the amount of time he had already lived. His blessing financially came back double and his wife must have changed. He had 10 more children. (laughs) There was a blessing on the other side of the bitterness, and he got it. He got it because he repented, and he got the revelation. Are you hearing me? Okay, let's go on to the next one. You say, I hate sad stories. Well, these are good stories. Naomi. What happened to Naomi? Well, God gave Naomi a wonderful daughter-in-law. But, you know, what's the use? She can't have any more children. And so she's never going to have any grandchildren. But Naomi gets back to Bethlehem and she says, oh, you know, just call me Mara, call me bitter. But she kind of comes alive and she says to Ruth, you know, we got a relative down there named Boaz. He's rich, he's spiritual, he's good looking. Why don't you go work in his field? And so Ruth does it. And Naomi really comes out of it into a revelation. And she tells Ruth how to get a husband. And it's in Ruth 3, 3, if you're single. It says, take a bath, buy a new dress, and get some Estee Lauder. It doesn't quite say it like that, but Ruth did those things. She marries Boaz, but their first son has to be called after her dead husband. So they have a little boy named Obed. They bring that little boy, Obed, to Naomi and present her a grandson. She has a grandson that carries the name of her dead son. Now we would say, impossible for her to be a grandmother. Well, honey, she is anyway. Because what? God blessed her. She got out of her bitterness into the what? Blessing. Everybody say it. Blessing. As long as you live in the bitterness, you'll never get the blessing. And here Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. You say, my goodness, Naomi is, the, is in that genealogy? Yeah, she's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ because of Obed. Oh, it is so key, folks, that we not live in bitterness. It defiles us. It grows up. It defiles other people. It can bring a generation blessing and keep us from the blessing God has for us. Emotional issues are so challenging. You can have struggles with depression. You can have struggles with fear, anxiety, frustration, worry. There's all kinds. There's a whole spectrum of emotional issues that challenge us and that we have to deal with. And I want to encourage you today that you do not have to be controlled by your emotions, that God can absolutely come and bring peace into your heart. 
can bring uh, uh, joy where there's been depression, can bring uh, serenity where there's been anxiety. God can absolutely replace all of the negative stuff and replace it with who he is and what he does, the fruit of the spirit. I want to encourage you, get on the phone right now. Call because we want to pray for you that God will help you with your emotions, not to be controlled by them, but to see his power overcome and also replace, to replace the bad with the good. So get on the phone or get on the website. And I want to encourage you with this. Remember that David always said, why so downcast? Oh, my soul, put your trust in God. And so many times I've said that to myself, Sarah, why are you upset? Why are you discouraged? Why are you nervous? Why are you frustrated? Why are you afraid? And sometimes we get afraid of the future. We get fearful of this situation. We get nervous about this. We worry about what hasn't happened, all kinds of things. But I want to encourage you today that God says to you, why so downcast? Oh, my soul, put your trust in God. And you and I both know that trusting in God is the best solution, the best solution for emotional struggles. So I encourage you today, get on the phone. Let us pray for you. Let us pray for those emotional needs that you have. If you can't get to the phone, then get on the website. We want to pray for you to see God turn what's been a struggle, what's been a difficulty, what's been a hardship, even what's been a failure for you in your emotional life. Turn that into his victory, into his peace, into his joy, into his strength, into his power. So let us pray for you. It's a tremendous privilege and an honor and a transformation for you even today. Emotional suffering can take many forms. Some people battle fear. Others carry the wounds of emotional abuse, grief, rejection, disappointment, betrayal, and even abandonment. But here's the amazing news. Jesus provided for healing and wholeness in our emotions on the cross, just as he provided for our physical healing. You just have to know how to appropriate it. Mom has a teaching that really unpacks this truth in a clear and powerful way. It is called Wholehearted, and for a limited time, it is our thank you gift to you for your gift of any amount to this ministry. Here's more information on how to share a gift and receive this great resource in your life for healing emotions. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. These powerful words are found in Isaiah 53 and make it clear that Jesus' redeeming healing work on the cross included healing for our emotions. For a limited time, you can receive Marilyn's teaching on healing for your emotions as our special thank you for sharing a gift of any size. It will help you understand how to appropriate healing for your emotions and to walk in wholeness and peace. But if you can share a seed gift of $53 or more in support of the outreaches of Maryland Hickey Ministries, we want to send you a powerful bundle of resources. We're calling our First Aid Kit for Your Emotions. This kit includes the powerful soft cover book, God's Prescription for a Hurting Heart. The two CD set titled Wholehearted, Keys for Emotional Healing and Prosperity for Your Soul, plus a bottle of anointing oil for your ministering this kind of healing to yourself and to those you love. Sow an Isaiah 53 seed gift right now and receive your own first aid kit for your emotions. Call or click right now. Share online at marilynandsarah.org. Walk in wholeness in your emotions and prosperity in your soul. Call today.